Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello again, I'm Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living Word is a teaching program, and we are currently in the book of Daniel, and we are going to be looking at a couple of things that he uh, heard, saw, uh, and received from the Lord today. And let's begin now with a word of prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day. It is indeed a glorious day that you have made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Heavenly Father, as you are continuing to show us what's in the book of Daniel, we pray, O oh Lord, that um, you know, we would just soak it all in and take into ourselves uh, those things that um, he received. He received them from your throne room. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that you might help us to understand uh, those things that he received, and how we might also take into account what we may be receiving from you and how that might help us in the days to come. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we begin where we left off yesterday, again, I would like to ask you, my listeners, for your help. Living Word is a listener-supported program, and until now I've had the funds I needed, which are $1,000 a month or $50 a day. Uh, and so I thank everybody for who everybody who has helped. At this time, I do need some help. I do need some help. I would like to have you help me remain on the air. And uh, again, little money makes big money. That was my mother's favorite saying, and she still says it to this day. And, and now my brothers and I, we say it often as well. It is true. Little money does add up to big money. And $1,000 may seem like a whole lot, but you know, it all adds up a little bit at a time. So your donation is indeed important. If, I, if this program has touched you in some way and, you, and you'd want me to remain on the air and, would, and you could help in some way, I'd appreciate it. And as I've mentioned the last couple of days, Living Word messages go far beyond South Texas through the Internet. Yesterday I gave you, gave you a list of uh, countries that have clicked on to the YouTube videos that I put up. I want to give you another eight today. Uh, countries such as Zambia, South Korea, New Zealand, uh, Colombia, Finland, England, Malaysia, and Romania are among the countries who have clicked on and have heard the programs. Now, there are many, many more people to reach and teach. And to continue to make that possible, we need to keep this on the air. And so it would be nice uh, if you could help me in some way. And if you're sensing the Lord do that, getting you involved, there are two ways to give. One is to send a check or money order to my post office box, which is P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, zip 78333-3810. Or you can give a donation online through PayPal in my website, and that website address is www.livingwordradio.org. And I sure do thank you in advance for your help. Now, yesterday we read, read through the chapters um, of the book of Daniel 9 and 10. And the prayer of Daniel 9 is absolutely extraordinary. Daniel, who we have seen throughout this book, uh, he's been a person who has just been on the up and up. He is not a person of wickedness. And, uh, you know, certainly he has been righteous. He has certainly treated his masters well, and he has been under the... Uh, the regimes of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, uh, also Darius and now Cyrus. And he certainly, he has done a very, very fine job being a foreigner in a foreign land, uh, serving foreign masters. And so we cannot imagine him, at least I can't imagine him doing anything wicked that would incur uh, God's blame, uh, except for the fact that people are born with a penchant for sin. And so in chapter 9, he confesses the sins of God's people, and he includes himself in the confession. There are 42 instances of Daniel using the words we, our, and us in his prayer. 
He did not point his finger at other people and say, they are the guilty ones, I'm innocent. No, he counted himself among the guilty because he was guilty in the general sense. He was guilty because he belonged to God's people, and God's people as a whole had been unfaithful to the Lord. Now, had they kept the commands of the Lord, had they been faithful to the covenant they had made with the Lord back at Mount Horeb when Moses was around, their being kicked out of the promised land would not have happened. Had they repented when the prophets had brought messages uh, from the Lord to them, they would not have been kicked out of the promised land. The Lord had given them chance after chance and opportunity after opportunity, and they had blown every one of them that he had given to them. Now, thankfully, Daniel knew that all it took was one person humbling themselves and turning themselves to the Lord in petition for the Lord to forgive Israel. That's all it was going to take. Now, the latter portion of uh, Daniel 9 is not at all clear to us, and we're going to get to that in just a little bit. Daniel 10 relays to us a vision, which, by the way, is connected to Daniel 11. But we're going to look at Daniel 10 more today. But it relays a vision to us that Daniel had during the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. To gain understanding of the vision, Daniel seeks the Lord. He goes into mourning for three weeks. And during those three weeks, he says he did not eat any choice food. He did not eat any meat, and no wine touched his lip, lips. He also used no oils on his body at all during the three weeks of mourning. He didn't do any of that until the three weeks were over. Now, we later learned that the Lord had dispatched a messenger from heaven to give Daniel the understanding he was seeking, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted the Lord's messenger for 21 days. In fact, the messenger from heaven may have actually resisted this messenger from heaven much longer, except that Michael, one of the chief princes of God, came to the aid of that first messenger in order to get that message through to Daniel. So he'd been seeking understanding for 21 days, but the Lord's messenger had been resisted for 21 days. Now what's going on here? Today we're going to find out what is going on in Daniel 10. There really is a lot of explaining today to do today, but let's start with Daniel 9, beginning at verse 20. Daniel writes, While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel the man I had seen in the earlier vision came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to you to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets, and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now, understanding the meaning of the 77s, the 77s, seven and the 62 sevens is not at all understood well by scholars at this time. Now, the second part of the sentence, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone, to atone for wickedness, 
to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy is better understood. Every one of these is a work God will do. Only God can put an end to sin. Only God can atone for wickedness. Only God can bring in everlasting righteousness. Only God can seal up vision and prophecy. Only God can anoint the most holy. That all of these uh, activities are God's activities isn't a surprise for us, or at least it shouldn't be. Over and over again throughout the Bible, we have heard what God was planning to do. Many times I've already mentioned how often God says in his word, I will. The first I will we heard in regard to what God would do to bring a remedy for sin is found in Genesis 3. To the serpent God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Regarding the new covenant God was going to make and how it would affect sin, we hear the Lord through Jeremiah declare, This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember and will remember their sins no more. As I read, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy, I can't help but think of Jesus and the work he accomplished on the cross and through the grave for us. Jesus' work is a finished work. He died once and for all, for all people. He made atonement for our sin. He ushered into the world everlasting righteousness. He did what we could never have done. And all we need to do to become beneficiaries of what Jesus did is to believe in him. Jesus took upon himself our sin, and we receive his righteousness. No, we do not understand the sevens of this particular chapter, but we do understand what Jesus did for the world. Now, as far as the phrase, uh, from the issuing of the decree to, the, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that phrase, it, that scholars generally agree that that is a reference of Cy, to Cyrus of Persia, who would be issuing a decree in 538 BC that was going to allow the Jews who had been taken captive by Babylon to return then to Jerusalem. After that, really the rest of the sevens don't compute. We are in need, really, of further revelation concerning this text. Uh, trouble we are hearing in this text is going to be coming. There is going to be war decreed into the end. But as we've already heard twice now in the book of Daniel, God will rule in favor of the saints. The kingdoms of this world will all fall, but the kingdom of God will endure forever. Let's move on to Daniel 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all during or until the three weeks were over. Now, Daniel was so very interested in understanding the revelation he had been given that he included fasting with his prayers. Fasting added an exclamation mark to his prayers. For folks not familiar with fasting, except for the fast that doctors expect us to do before we have our blood drawn or before surgeries, the person going on the fast is quite free to choose. Generally speaking, quite free to choose the fast he or she wants to go on. Daniel's fast was a fast that included no choice food, no meat, no wine, and no lotions on his body. He also chose the duration of the fast. It would last three weeks. During the length of the fast, his attention would be turned toward the Lord, for it was the Lord alone who could give him the understanding he needed. 
I've given a little bit of explanation about fasting here because it is a practice God expects of believers in Jesus. Now, how can I say that? Well, the answer is found in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. Now, Jesus taught many things to the crowd listening to him. But concerning fasting, Jesus said, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus did not say, if you fast, but when you fast. And he said it twice, when you fast. Again, fasting adds an exclamation mark to our prayers. It is also a way for us to humble ourselves before the Lord. When we add fasting to our prayers, our bodies become participants with our mind, our soul, and our spirit in our prayers. Though Jesus taught that we are to fast, the actual implementation of fasting as something Christians do has really just been regaining popularity over the last decade or so. Before that, it was hard to find people who fasted. It was hard to find a lot of information on what fasting is and how it was supposed to be done. Now there is much more information available. Just about everyone can fast because the kind of fast one goes on is generally up to the person doing the fasting. People with health issues may need to take additional precautions for safety, and it is never safe to go without water for long periods of time, three days at the max. But fasting is generally safely done since it is up to the individual doing the fasting to set up the restrictions of the fast. I hope this is a little bit of information that is helpful to you, Having participated in several fasts, I can say that I have found them to be helpful to me and to my prayer life. Now, we don't know exactly what day of the month Daniel began his fast. What we do know from what you know, we have already read is that it lasted 21 days. What we're about to read is that the revelation Daniel was seeking was held up for, an entire time, for the entire time of his fast. Listen to that. The revelation that he wanted to receive was held up for the entire length of his fast. Let's read on to hear this, and then I'm going to make some more comments. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you, and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Now let me try and explain these first three verses, or these verses here. St. Paul, writing to the people of Ephesus, wrote, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Daniel's 
angelic messenger, though dispatched by God on the first day Daniel began to gain, you know, began to pray in order to gain understanding, uh, began to pray by humbling himself before the Lord. This angelic messenger that was being sent to Daniel was stopped from getting to Daniel for 21 days. Daniel's angelic messenger identified the one who resisted him as the prince of the Persian kingdom. Now, the prince of the Persian kingdom is not a reference to a human being, but it is likely a reference to a territorial demonic spirit which had the responsibility to guard for Satan the geographic territory of Persia. Very likely, there were many more demons assigned to Persia, but for 21 days, it was the demonic prince over Persia who resisted the heavenly angel sent to give Daniel understanding of the revelation he had received. Later on, we will hear that Michael is identified as Daniel's prince. Michael certainly could have been Daniel's guardian angel, but since Michael is identified as one of the chief princes, we are probably learning the identity of the angel assigned to God's people Israel as a whole. Just because we hear of a couple of specific names or territories mentioned, we must understand that there were many other angels connected to these territories, these regions, and these peoples. The point being made is this. God wanted Daniel to gain the understanding of the vision he had received earlier and for which he had set aside 21 days as a period of fasting. God dispatched an angel with the information Daniel needed. The angel God dispatched to Daniel could not get to Daniel with the information for a period of 21 days. Only with the added help of Michael, Daniel's prince, was the angel able to get through to Daniel. Later on, we're going to hear that the angel sent by God to Daniel will go back and fight against the prince of Persia, and after that, the prince of Greece would come. But again, remember, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Though we cannot see the spiritual warfare that is going on all around us, there nevertheless is great and grave spiritual warfare going on all around us all the time. Now, what was the Prince of Persia trying to do? Well, he was trying to prevent the information God wanted Daniel to have from getting to him. Without the information, uh, Daniel was left without insight. Without the information, Daniel could... Uh, could not know what God was doing or about to do among his people. And Daniel, uh, he could continue to pray, but he couldn't pray with any kind of understanding, any kind of uh, spiritual insight. And prayer, by the way, is spiritual warfare. Now, God wanted Daniel to know what was going to take place in the future. The prince of Persia was hoping to prevent a future move of God. Uh, it is a tremendous struggle that we are in. It is light versus darkness, the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of Satan. And we already know that God's kingdom of light wins. But the warfare goes on until all of God's purposes are carried out in the world. Now let's read on, beginning at verse 15. While he was speaking this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I am helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O man, highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, speak my Lord since you have given me strength. So he said, do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince, and in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Now, we've already jumped into chapter 11, but that one thought that no one supports me 
against them except Michael, your prince, is connected to chapter 11, verse 1. And so I had to read them together because uh, our chapter chapter uh, differentiations there, our chapter divisions just isn't good right here. So he has come to tell Daniel what is written in the book of truth. And he and Michael, they have been supporting one another often. And so now we get to verse 2. Now let's read uh, through much of chapter 11. And then tomorrow we will look a little bit more at what chapter 11 means or might mean. So this angelic messenger goes on to say, Now then, I tell you the truth. Three more kings will appear in Persia, and then a fourth, who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will appear who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has appeared, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be handed over together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. One from her family line will arise to take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south but will retreat to his own country His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. And this is where we are going to stop today. We'll continue on with chapter 11 tomorrow with with a lot more explanation. But uh, let me just bless you with that wonderful blessing that the Lord gave Moses to give to Aaron uh, to bless God's people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message, and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org. If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.